Uh, we know that the universe had a beginning and it had a beginning and is designed, it appears, right now. Uh, what about life? When you look out into a telescope, you can see the universe is designed, but I think when you look into a microscope, you can see life is designed. And this is uh, apparently, according to evolutionists, where we all came from, a one-celled amoeba. You heard of the theory of macroevolution? From the goo to you via the zoo. Okay, this was the goo. And in Darwin's day, they didn't really know how complex a cell was. Uh, and I'd like to show you what actually is in a cell. But before we get there, notice that it doesn't say made by God or made by natural forces on it. In other words, when you observe something like an amoeba, you have to make an interpretation as to how that amoeba arrived. Did it arrive by some sort of natural means or did it arrive by some sort of intelligence? And in order to demonstrate what Darwin didn't know when he started the theory of macroevolution, we have to, uh, we have to go to your breakfast table. Does anyone in here like alphabet cereal? Let's suppose you want to have a bowl of alphabet cereal one morning. You're a teenager, and you come downstairs to have a bowl of alphabet cereal, and you see that the box is knocked over on the table, and right in the middle of the table, the letters spell, take out the garbage, mom. <laughs> what are you going to assume? The cat knocked the box over? Earthquake shook the house? No, what you're going to say is that's intelligent design from an intelligent being, mom. Or let's suppose you're walking along the beach and you see in the sand, John loves Mary. What do you think, the waves did that? <laughs> Crabs came out of the water and made that message? No, you're going to say there had to be intelligence. Even if you didn't see anybody inscribe that in the sand, you know from all your prior experience that messages only come from minds. Well, if messages only come from minds, where does this message come from? DNA, the four-letter four letter genetic alphabet that every living thing has. Every living thing has DNA. And in your DNA, in every one of your 40 trillion or so molecules, I should molecules, every one of your 40 trillion or so cells, you have a message in DNA that is about 3.5 billion letters long. All the letters are in the right order. There is no known biological, chemical, or physical reason why the letters go in this order. We know that A always goes with T and C always goes with G, but this order right here is your unique software, if you will. Why are the letters in that order? In fact, Bill Gates, who is the uh, CEO or former CEO of Microsoft, put it this way, and he's not a Christian. He said, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. Where I come from, if there's a program, there must be a programmer. If there's a code, there must be a coder. If there is a message, there must be a messenger. And what we're saying here is DNA is like a message. It's like take out the garbage mom, but it's a lot more complicated, a lot longer than take out the garbage mom. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, Frank. You say that in each one of our cells, there's a message three and a half billion letters long. Well, maybe it started real primitive. Maybe it started in an amoeba, a very short message. Well, actually, even if it did start in an amoeba, it's a very short message. To get a much longer message where all the letters are in order, you still couldn't evolve it, evolve it by random means, right? I mean, let's just grant, say, a program like Microsoft PowerPoint, which is the program I'm using right now. If you just granted us that program and you began to modify the code randomly, what would happen to the program? Would it get better or worse? Right? It's going to shut down. It's going to, it's going to crash. Because you can't modify something randomly and get anything but gibberish. But let's humor the, uh, 
Let's humor the uh, suggestion here that maybe it started primitively. How much DNA is in an amoeba, a one-celled amoeba? And by the way, an amoeba is so small, you can line up several hundred amoebas in an inch. How much information do you think is in an amoeba? The amount of information in an amoeba is about equivalent to a thousand volumes of an encyclopedia. Oh, some of you in here don't, don't even know what an encyclopedia is. You're, you're too young, right? You're going, <laughs> Years ago, people used to come to your door and go, hey, I've got these books you need to buy. Now your encyclopedia is on your iPhone. Okay, it's called Google. <laughs> All right, but in the, in, back in the day, these big, thick books that you'd buy would have the information that you'd need to know to be an informed citizen. Well, imagine a thousand of those crammed into an amoeba, microscopic, microscopically small. All the letters are in the right order. Where did that come from? If take out the garbage mom requires an intelligence, it would seem to me that a thousand volumes of an encyclopedia worth of a message requires intelligence as well. The first life requires an intelligent cause, it seems to me anyway. And you might say, Frank, how do you know there's this much information in an amoeba? Did some Christian tell you this? No, you know who told me this? Richard Dawkins, <laughs> the most famous atheist in the world perhaps. In his book, The Blind Watchmaker, he says there's that much information in an amoeba. Well, if there's that much information in an amoeba, and he admits there's nobody knows any naturalistic cause for this, why wouldn't you suggest it's intelligence? In our country, we had a movie that was made about 10 years ago. It's called Expelled. Has anyone seen the movie Expelled? Few of us have. It was a documentary about how uh, academic people who are open to intelligent design in the academy are being expelled from the academy. They're denied tenure. They're blackballed from research. They can't get into peer-reviewed journals because the gatekeepers of the peer-reviewed journals don't want their theory in their journals. And at the end of this documentary, it was narrated by a man by the name of Ben Stein, uh, he interviewed Richard Dawkins, and he went to Richard Dawkins, the biologist here at Oxford, and he said, Dr. Dawkins, how do you think life began? And Dr. Dawkins said, no one has any idea how life began. And Ben Stein said, well, do you think it's possible that there's some other, there's some explanation? I mean, what would be your best guess as to how life began? And he said, well, I suppose you could say, Aliens brought life here. And at that point, Ben Stein said, I don't believe it. Dr. Dawkins believes in intelligent design. Why? Why did he say that? What's an alien? An intelligent designer, right? If an alien brought life here, that's an intelligent designer. It's not natural processes. Now, it just puts the question off a step, though. Who created the alien? Right? That's not the same as saying who created God because God is outside the universe, he's uncreated. An alien is somebody inside the universe who is created. So he doesn't solve the problem. But what he's admitting is the problem is so difficult for natural laws to create life that he's going to suggest an alien brought life here. Now let me ask you guys a question, and this is a speculation, admittedly, but let me ask you a question. Why would somebody like Richard Dawkins be open to an alien bringing life here, but not God? Because both are intelligent designers, right? Why, why an alien and not God? Does anyone have any possible insights in on this? There you go, Dr. Solomon has it. I think, I agree with him, an alien doesn't bring morality with him, but God does, right? God is going to make moral demands on your life, an alien won't. So it's fine to be okay with aliens, it's not fine to be okay with God. In fact, both Richard Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss, the guy you saw earlier on Colbert, have admitted that one could make a reasonable case for a deistic God. What's a deistic God? That there's a God who created the universe, 
and got everything in motion, but he doesn't get involved in the universe. He doesn't do miracles, and he doesn't care about you and what you do. Why would they be open to a creator God, but not a God actively involved? Because a God actively involved makes moral demands. But think about this. It's a short step from deism to theism. It's a long step from atheism to deism, but they're, they're willing to take it. They realize that the universe is so orderly, and we'll talk much more about this tomorrow night. The universe is so orderly that there could be an orderer out there. But they don't want this orderer to bring morality with them. As I said last night, the elephant in the room is not evidence. The elephant in the room is morality and accountability. People don't want it. People are not on a truth quest. Most of us, we're not. We're not on a truth quest. We're on a happiness quest. And we are going to believe whatever we think is going to make us happy. The problem is you can make yourself happy over the short term by doing a lot of stupid, sinful things, but over the long term, it's a disaster. And everyone in here who's over 40 knows what I'm talking about because many of us have tried it ourselves, right? <laughs> We're going to do it our way. And then we realize, wow, this didn't really work out the way I wanted it to. So are we on a truth quest or are we on a happiness quest? The only way to get true contentment and happiness is to go straight through truth, and Jesus is the truth. Amen. Now, if you try and suggest that intelligence is required for life, you are going to get what is known as the God of the gaps argument. What is the God of the gaps argument? God of the gaps is when you can't figure out how a natural cause could have created something, you plug God into the gap of your knowledge and you say, oh, I'm just going to say God did this. Why is suggesting that intelligence is required for life not a God of the gaps argument. Because we're not arguing from what we don't know, we're arguing from what we do know. When you see take out the garbage mom on your breakfast table, you don't just lack a natural explanation for that. That's positive evidence for mom, right? It's positive evidence for an intelligent being. Similarly, when you're walking along, walking along the beach and you see John loves Mary, you don't just lack a natural explanation for that. You know that's positive evidence for an intelligent being. Similarly, when you see a thousand volumes of an encyclopedia in a one-celled amoeba or 3.5 billion letters in every one of your 40 trillion cells, you know that's positive evidence for intelligence, not just a lack of a natural argument. You understand what I'm saying here? And by the way, what you can do when people say, well, you're, this is a God of the gaps argument, you can say, no, you have a natural law of the gaps argument. You, you have a lot of faith that blind natural laws can do what we only see intelligence doing, creating messages, creating complexity like this, specified complexity. All right? Now, tomorrow, we're going to look not only at uh, an amoeba, but we're going to look at you. If we had time right now to talk about how amazing you are, you'd be blown away. But we're going to save that till tomorrow night. All right? This is you, by the way, in the womb at 11 weeks. So we'll talk more about that tomorrow night. All right? Let's move on now to the moral argument. Uh, those first two arguments, cosmological and teleological, have scientific evidence behind them. The moral argument, however, just doesn't have science behind it. It's not a scientific argument, but it's the argument we've all known since we were very small children. And in fact, let's imagine you go out into the woods. Long trip out into the forest. You're hiking for several hours, and you get turned around. You get lost. Your cell phone dies. You don't know how to get home. You know the direction from which you came, but you don't even know where, where that direction is now. So what you do is you take out a magnetic compass. That's all you have. And you know a magnetic compass is supposed to point to magnetic north. So once you know where north is, you can figure out how to get home, right? But you take out your magnetic compass, and instead of pointing to magnetic north, the compass always points to you. No matter where you turn, the compass is always pointing to you. How helpful would that compass be? 
Not helpful at all. You know where you are. You're trying to figure out where north is. Question. Why do we think that the compass always points to us? I mean, as Christians, even as Christians, and for those of you who are not Christians in here, you may think this as well. Why do we think that if things don't always go our way, that either God doesn't exist, he's evil, or he's forgotten about us? Do you realize that whether or not God exists, you are not the center of the universe? And neither am I. But we, we, we sometimes think we are. Things always have to go our way. The compass always needs to point to me. Now, by the way, is there a true compass to life? Is there a right way to live life? Yes. Yes. Only if there's a purpose to life. Yes. In fact, a lot of times... I'll get questions, and maybe you'll get questions, questions that are very sensitive questions in today's society. Normally, there are questions that have to do with sex, homosexuality, transgenderism, could, could be any one of a number of issues. And sometimes, when, I'm, when I get a question, what, what, do, what do I think about, say, homosexuality? My answer is, it doesn't matter what I think about it, because the compass doesn't point to me. I'm not the arbiter of right and wrong. So I will ask the question back to somebody. I'll say, I can't answer that question unless I know what the purpose of life is. Because if there's no purpose to life, there's no right way or wrong way to live it. Right? There's got to be a purpose. Like, if there was no purpose to a football game, there would be no difference between scoring a goal and not scoring a goal. Because there's no goal to the game. Right? Right? So in order for you to say this is a good play or a bad play, you'd have to have some rules. You'd have to have some purpose to the game. If there's no purpose, there's no right or wrong, there's no right way to live it. So the question here is, is there a purpose to life and is there a right way to live it? And when it comes to a compass, is there a true moral compass? Is there a right way to live life? Where does the moral compass point? Let me ask you this. How can you discover who's right and who's wrong, Mother Teresa or Hitler? How can you discover it? Well, let me ask you this. Um, how do you know which map of Scotland is better? Is it map A or map B? What would you need to see in order to know which map was better? What would you need to see? What evidence? What would you need to see, really? You would need to see a real, unchangeable place called Scotland, right? Because that's the only way you can compare to see which map is better. If Scotland doesn't exist, then these two maps are meaningless, right? But since Scotland does exist, we can see map A, while it's not perfect, is a better representation of the real Scotland than is map B. In other words, we have an external referent to which we can compare both maps. That's exactly what we do when we compare Mother Teresa and Hitler. Mother Teresa wasn't the standard. Hitler wasn't the standard. There's a standard beyond both of them by which we measure both of them. And we say Mother Teresa measured up to the standard better than did Hitler. If the standard doesn't exist, then you can't say Mother Teresa was better than Hitler. In fact, C.S. Lewis, who as you know is from your country here, during World War II was doing BBC broadcasts. And the BBC broadcasts were later put into a book called Mere Christianity. And in that book, he said, the moment you say that one set of moral ideas can be better than another, you are, in fact, measuring them against a standard beyond both of these moral ideas. He said, in other words, if we're going to say that we here in the UK are better than the Nazis, there has to be a standard beyond both us and the Nazis to say we're closer to the truth than the Nazis are. In other words, the standard that measures two things must be different from those two things. And that standard turns out to be God's nature. Now, last year, I went and spoke at a church in South Dakota in the United States. And uh, 
I was there for several nights. We went through all this material in detail. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And the second night I was there during the Q&A, a couple of young men got up to the podium or up to the microphone and uh, they were atheists, which is great. We love atheists coming to these events and they expressed their atheism and we had some good dialogue back and forth. They were in their 20s, early, early 20s or so. I didn't think anything of it. Anyway, the next night, about a 50-year-old man got up to the uh, microphone and he had a question written on two sheets of paper and he began to read the question but 10 seconds into the question, he broke down crying. He couldn't even ask it. So I walked down to him and he handed me the two sheets of paper and he just said, read it, read it. So I'm trying to digest this question as I'm walking back up to the platform. And by the time I got up to the platform, I realized that that man was upset for two reasons. Reason number one, the man, his name is Steve, was upset because he had just discovered recently that a supposed friend of his by the name of Tom had been sexually abusing Steve's daughter from the time she was age four to the time she was age 14 in his own home under his nose. He never saw it. Second reason Steve was upset is because the two young men who were there the night before who were atheists are his sons who used to be Christians and now they're atheists because as soon as they heard that this had happened to their sister, they said, there is no God. If there was a good God, he wouldn't have allowed this to happen to our sister. There's no God. In fact, one of them was going to a Roman Catholic seminary. He left the seminary as soon as he heard the news. He said, that's it, there is no God. So I said to Steve, I said, Steve, it's okay to be mad at God. The Bible writers are mad at God, some of them. Read the, some of the Psalms, read Habakkuk, read Lamentations. God, where are you? Why is this going on? Why us? At some point, Steve, I think your sons will realize, I hope, that this is not a good argument against God. In fact, I said... I don't know when the right time is, Steve, but I want you to say this to your sons when the right time comes. If there is no God, what that man, Tom, did to your sister isn't really wrong. It's just your opinion. Because if there's no standard beyond us, everything's just a matter of opinion. So you can't say it's really wrong. There's no compass outside of yourself. The compass for Tom just pointed to him. How can you say he's really wrong if there's nothing beyond humanity? Now, this guy, um, Tom, everyone knows he did it, but he's not in jail. Why? Because every time the trial comes up, Jessica, the young woman who was abused, psychologically checks out. She cannot testify against him. She wanted to marry him. She was a young, impressionable girl. He said, we're going to have babies ourselves one day. He was saying this to her from the time she was age four years old. So I said, Steve, I want you to say this to your sons when it's the right time. If there is no God, then the man who did this to your sister will never get justice. Because there's no justice here on earth if she doesn't testify, and there's not going to be any justice in the afterlife because according to atheism, there is no afterlife. Do you really think that's the way the universe is? Do you really think there's no such thing as justice? The reason you're upset, rightfully so, is because you know a great injustice has been done. But there can't be something unjust unless something is just. In other words, there can't be something not right unless something is. Something can't be immoral unless something is. So your outrage is well placed, but your atheism doesn't help you at all because there's never going to be justice done. In fact, everybody's upset about something with regard to the world. Do you realize 
that I don't care what somebody's worldview is, atheist, agnostic, Hindu, Christian, Muslim, Mormon, doesn't matter what the worldview is. I don't care who you're talking to. If you ask this question, what's wrong with the world? Nobody's going to say nothing. Right? Everyone's going to say, oh yeah, the world's got problems. In other words, there are injustices in the world. Everybody agrees with that, right? If there are injustices in the world, there must be something known as justice. But justice is an immaterial concept. How many molecules are in the justice molecule? Or in the, in the, in the justice, or how many atoms are in the justice molecule? It's a stupid question. Why? Because justice isn't made of molecules. It's immaterial. It's God's nature that's just, and any deviation from that is unjust. Now, Jessica, the girl who was abused, decided she was going to have something good come from this awful experience, so she actually wrote a book. Here it is. It's called Not Your Princess by Jessica Mitzel. I read one chapter of this book. I couldn't read any more. Jessica is now getting phone calls and emails from other young people who are going through this. She can hardly handle it herself. Adults, if you ever have a young person come to you and says, Uncle Joe did this to me, do not dismiss it. Maybe Uncle Joe would do that. And her father, Steve, wanted me to tell you this because too many people, too many young people are suffering under this grave, awful injustice, and they have nowhere to turn. Ladies and gentlemen, is sexual abuse of children evil? Is it? Yes. If it is, God exists. Yes. Because there'd be no such thing as evil unless there was good, and there'd be no such thing as good unless God existed. I know that sounds counterintuitive, and we can ask the question, why would God allow it to continue? Which is a question we deal with in the Stealing from God book. But to say that evil like this disproves God, it doesn't disprove God, it actually proves God. Because there'd be no such thing as evil unless there was good, and there'd be no such thing as good unless God existed. So God's moral nature is morality's true north. Ah, the compass doesn't point to me. The compass doesn't point to you. The compass doesn't point to Tom. The compass points to God's nature, and any deviation from God's nature is what we call evil. Now, by the way, Christopher Hitchens, whom I had the opportunity to debate a couple of times, wrote a book called God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. I don't know if you've seen this book, but actually there's a lot of truth in his book. Because he talks about all the evil religious people have done. In fact, uh, he, 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 I read his book because I had to debate him a couple of times. And I, I said, Christopher, much of what you say in your book is true. But you're kind of proving our worldview. Christian worldview. Why? Because we all agree that religious people have done evil things. We all agree everyone's done evil things. That's why we need a savior. In fact, I said to him, Christopher, um, I'm a hypocrite. I can't live up to the pure words of Christ. But if I could, I wouldn't need a savior. Because in the book, Christopher says religion poisons everything. But religion does not poison everything. Everything poisons religion. You see, I poison religion because I can't live up to Christianity. But if I could, I wouldn't need a savior, right? In fact, I said to him, when people say to me, I can't go to church because there's too many hypocrites down there, I always say, come on down, pal. We got room for one more. <laughs> of course we're all hypocrites. If we were perfect, we wouldn't need a savior. We're fallen creatures. The hospital is a, all right, the hospital. The church is a hospital for sinners. It's not a country club for saints. I know theologically we're saints because we're covered with the blood of Christ. But practically, we're sinners. And that's why we need one another. In fact, uh, I don't know if you know, but Christopher has a brother who's still living by the name of Peter Hitchens. And uh, Peter is a Christian. And uh, he said that Christopher's book should not be called God is not great. Christopher's book should be called Man is not great. Because that's really what it's about. It's about all the evil men, men and women have done. Well, we agree with that. 
That's why we need a savior because we're fallen and we can't get there on our own. Now, Christopher was brilliant, as you know, and it was tragic that um, he died about, uh, geez, five and a half, I think it's five and a half years ago now. In fact, a couple of weeks before, well, it was actually Thanksgiving in our country was late November of 2011, and I emailed him. We had two debates, one in 08 and one in 09, and I emailed him, and I knew he was undergoing cancer treatment, and I, I knew some doctors who might be able to help him, and I said, I know these doctors, maybe I could connect them with you, and he said, uh, I'd like to renew our debates. I was like, wow, maybe this guy is recovering. So I said, do you want me to set something up? And he said, uh, not quite yet, not ready yet. Well, two and a half weeks later, I learned he had died. I don't know if he thought he was recovering or he was just in a state of uh, optimism, but two and, a half weeks, two and a half weeks later, he died. Now, if you look at Christopher's work, which I say there's a lot of truth in it, but you really realize he was just mad at God. In fact, he called God a cosmic North Korean dictator, which is kind of good imagery if you're an atheist, right? That God is peering down on us, and he's, he's, he says he's... He's peering down and intruding into our sex lives. Once again, it's always about sex, right? So at the end of the both debates I have with him, by the way, you can see the debates on our website for free, crossexamine.org. I said, you can sum up Christopher Hitchens' book in one sentence. Here it is. There is no God, and I hate him. <laughs> he was mad at God. So, when we add these three arguments up now, the cosmological, teleological, and moral arguments, we can draw some conclusions about God. In fact, from these three arguments, from the cosmological argument, we can see that this being is immaterial, timeless, and spaceless. Why? Because he created material time and space, so he can't be made of material time and space. Secondly, this being is also extremely powerful because he created out of nothing. Do you realize that we always create out of pre-existing material? God creates out of nothing. What rocks dream about? Nothing. Non-being. Also, this being is intelligent because this universe, as we've seen, is designed, and so are you. The being also sustains creation and has purpose. In fact, we'll talk about the sustaining aspect of God tomorrow night. From the moral argument, we can see he's absolutely morally perfect, and he's also personal. How do we know he's personal from the moral argument? Because you only have a moral obligation to persons. You don't have a moral obligation to impersonal forces. If you go try and say, dunk a basketball, you're not sinning against the law of gravity, right? You only sin against persons. We also know this being is personal from the cosmological argument because, as I said before, in order to go from a state of nothingness to a state of creation, someone had to make a choice and only persons make choices. Again, impersonal forces like gravity don't make choices. They don't decide what to do. They just do the same thing over and over again. Now, take a look at this. We have an immaterial, timeless, spaceless, extremely powerful, extremely intelligent, sustaining creator who has purpose, who's absolutely morally perfect and personal. This is the God of biblical Christianity identified without reference to the Bible. We haven't even opened the Bible yet, and we have a being that looks like the God of the Bible. Now, are we sure it's the God of the Bible at this point? No. Why? What we seem to be sure of, again, if our reasoning is good to this point, we seem to be sure of the fact that we have a theistic God. Remember we started here with these three categories? If theism is true, what does that say about pantheism and atheism? They can't be true. Law of non-contradiction, right? We talked about this last night. Opposite ideas cannot be both true at the same time and in the same sense. So, if theism is true, the question is, which theism is true? Is it Judaism, Christianity, or Islam? Well, which is it? For that, we'd have to go another step. If God wanted to tell us which theistic God is true, what could he do that only he could do that would get our attention? He could do a miracle... And that's point three. 
Because miracles will tell us whether we're following Allah, Jesus, or just Yahweh. 